Ah, wacht even, mijn tal. There she is again. Yeah. Yes. And now your yeah. camera is working uh, well. We still have five participants. Ah, six. Shall I type, uh, but well, I can type it in the, So shall I begin? Uh, well, from, wait for mom, one moment, because uh, if you want to switch, I have to ask the people now. First, there are seven participants. I s Good. I will switch to uh, the other mode. Hope it works. No, it doesn't work, but uh, I have still, I can do it like that. For all new participants, they will. Uh... So if you don't want to be visible, you can click, uh, you can mute yourself, you can close your camera. And you also can click on the red button next to your name and then you will disappear, although you still will be able to, uh, to, to hear what and see what's happening. Okay, I think we can start. Yes, uh, good, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Natal Dessing. Um, I'm a director of um, Lucis. And I'm um, uh, very happy that I'm um, today can um, welcome uh, Dr. Ingrid Vlaskerhoed for a lecture in our What's New lecture series. Um, uh, um, for a long time, um, we've been uh wanting to invite uh Ingvild to our lecture series uh Ingvild Plaskerud is an historian uh, of religion who has specialized in the study of 12 or Shiism in Iran and Europe she is the author of visualizing belief and piety in Ira Iranian Shiism and the main argument of this book is that visualizing and seeing have re representative and transformative 
qualities. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, observation. Her research interests also include gender, ritual, uh, and, uh, and, and 12 or Shia migration to the West and Muslim youth. She's the editor with Richard Natwig of Muslim Pilgrimage in Europe, and to which uh, Maya also contributed a chapter, I believe. She's also a filmmaker. Um, and she produced an ethnographic film entitled Standard Bearers of Hussein, Women Commemorating Karbala. Uh, and it's through this film that we came into contact. Um, so I ordered this film. I don't know whether you remember, Ingrid, but I ordered yes. this film in 2016. Hmm. So, um, uh, at, at that time, I, um, I I wanted to use this film in a course that I taught for MA students on pilgrimage. So I'm, I'm very, very happy that we have, have you here now in our lecture series. Perhaps it, it has been made easier because of uh, uh, Corona. So that, that in a sense, that, 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 that that's good. Um, I, I'm very happy we will give this lecture uh, today. Uh, the title of the lecture is Localizing Islam, Self-Education Among Young I think uh, Natal's connection fell away, so maybe... So, uh, so you couldn't hear me? No. So maybe you, now you're... Uh, we can hear you, so please, if you want to finish your sentence, you were... Uh, oh. You were uh, so what, reading what, out where, the title. Where did, where, what, you were reading out the title. When did I fall away? You were reading out the title. Oh, well, uh, with the title. So um, uh, the title of the lectures, uh, I, I, I'm sure that that, that uh, Ingrid will will be able to say it herself again. But localizing Islam, self-education among young Muslims in Northern Europe. I'm very happy again that that you are here, um, Ingrid, and, and and please take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, for this very uh, detailed introduction. And thank you also very much for this opportunity to speak at the Leiden What's New lecture series. I'm looking very much forward to sharing with you uh, the results from my ongoing research and also to engage in discussions about what I see as possible results. I had planned to say a few words about my academic background, but that you have done now so beautifully so I will just bring up an image from the film that you made and that you mentioned and speaking about pilgrimage there is actually what you see in the picture to the right um, a proxy shrine it is a proxy of Ruqayya's shrine in Damascus that is put up and visited and then taken down every year um, then some images from the book you mentioned on visualizing belief and piety in Iranian Shiism. You can see here some of the kind of materials I was engaging with. And here is also an image of um, the book Muslim Pilgrimage in Europe that, as you mentioned, Marju has also written a very beautiful article, um, a book chapter to Okay, I shall then um, uh, go to the topic of today. I am also interested in the formation of 12 Shiism in uh, Western Europe, which is now an expanding field uh, of research. And I have also published a few articles on the topics related to that already. But today I shall present and discuss the proliferation of a new uh, self-governed religious organizations among the young 12 Shia Muslims in Europe. And since 2009, nine 12 Shia groups 
have established themselves in the Oslo region. The groups are self-governed in the sense that they are independent from um, the mosques and they are initiated and administrated by the young. The number of youth groups is relatively high, so nine, considering that there by 2017 were about 10, 12 Shia mosques and religious centers in the area. And some of them also support their own youth associations. So the question I address then today is, why do 12 Shia youth in Norway organize in self-governed groups independently from the mosques? Before I go deeper into this question, I will say a few words about the data and the method. The data drawn from nine groups run by 12 Shia youth from the age of 30 to 15. The first group was established in 2009 and the most recent in 2021, all in the Oslo region. Most members are born and or raised in Norway while their parents' cultural heritage is mainly from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. Their shared language is Norwegian, but many master the language of their parents. In terms of organization, the groups typically have a board or an organizing committee, and in some cases, both men and women are represented. It is difficult to establish the number of members in each group. Typically, a core circle is involved in planning and organizing activities, while additional people attend meetings. Some, um, and a much higher number, are registered as members on the group's Facebook accounts. In obtaining data, I have used a combination of methods, including participant observation, at meetings and stands organized by the groups, semi-informal interviews with members, and reviewing information available at Facebook and homepages. So then, I return to the question, why do they organize in self-governed groups independently from the mosque? Approaching organized religion from the perspective of those who organize, a theoretical underpinning in my analysis draw from Scott. He has connected the concept temporality of generation to the notion of problem space, understood as a discursive formation of concepts, ideas, meanings, etc., and a context of argument. Importantly, what defines a problem space are not simply the post problems, but the questions asked and the answers that seem worth having. And to unwrap these issues in the data, I have asked, what are the youth's motivations for establishing self-governed groups. Here I seek to establish their perceived post problems and the questions they ask. And secondly, how do the members proceed or respond to achieve their objectives? And by examining how they respond, I seek to identify the answers that they opted for. Now, the group's motivations for organizing. Their motivations for organizing varied somewhat, but three important questions were addressed based on their everyday experiences as young Muslims in Norway. How to adequately respond to current ideas about Islam and Muslims endorsing violence? How to adequately respond to offenses against Islam in a peaceful and socially acceptable manner while insisting on the right to freedom of religion? 
how to support each other in finding ways to live harmoniously in the Norwegian society. I will first give a brief background to the social context which has motivated these questions. The Norwegian public's perception of religion is very much shaped by new, uh, news media and social media. The global media debate on Islam and Muslims has in recent years, particularly uh, since 9-11-2001, been associated with a Western-led war on Islamic terror and new eruptions of war and violence instigated by individuals and groups acting in the name of Islam. Among these, sorry, among these is the Islamic State uh, gaining momentum since 2014 when seeking to establish a Salafi inspired state in Iraq and Iran. Another cluster of events is the violent reactions from Muslims across the world to what they per perceive as attempts to defame Islam, such as the many Muhammad cartoon crisis and the production of the Islamophobic film Innocence of Muslims in 2012. Non-Muslims often see violent reactions from Muslims as indications of their lack of respect for freedom of speech. In addition, there are prolonged media discussions in Western European countries about the legal status of Muslim rights, such as women wearing headscarf, halal food, minarets on mosques, and debates about the influence from visiting imams trained abroad. Norwegian newspapers, radio, television, and social media have addressed such, so, such global debates combined with national versions of related topics. Debates about Islam and Muslims have revolved around politics of integration, Islamic terrorism, and whether Islam is compatible with Western values identified, for example, as freedom of speech and women's rights. In 2008, and increasingly since 2012, when many of the 12 Shia groups were established, the debates were stirred by the establishment of two Sunni Salafi youth groups in Norway. One is Islam Net, founded in 2008, which takes its, its authoritative guidance from Salafi scholars based in Saudi Arabia and can be described as an expression of Puritan Salafism. The other is the Prophet uh, Ummah, established that it was consolidated in 2012 after organizing street demonstrations against the Prophet Muhammad cartoons in 2010 and the Norwegian participation in the NATO ISA forces in Afghanistan in 2012 and again the Islamophobic film The Innocence of Muslims also in 2012. The group has endorsed Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq, and can be described as Salafist jihadist. Its endorsement of the IS is problematic. The Norwegian Police Security Service estimates that around 1,000 Norwegian male Muslims went to Syria to fight for the Islamic State, the El Nusra Front and related group. As some combatants began returning to Norway in 2015, the public debate revolved around to what extent they and Islam represent a national security threat. A telling example of the general lack of trust towards the Muslims, uh, the Muslim population in Norway around the time that many of the groups were established, is the speculations that evolved in the media after the terror attack uh, in and near Oslo on the 22nd of July, 2011. 77 people were killed when a bomb detonated by the government building 
and young people attending the Labour Party annual summer camp at Utaya were massacred. Before the perpetrator was identified, the media speculated on possible connections with Islamic terrorism. As it turned out, the terrorist was a young male ethnic Norwegian motivated by ideas to be found to the far right. Those initial speculations created a new awareness among many Muslims about how they are imagined among fellow citizens. A question emerging amongst the 12 youth since 2009 has been how to present a more correct understanding of Islam as a peaceful religion. In addition, the youth were motivated to organize to support each other in the face of criticism they encountered in everyday life, for example, women for wearing headscarf in the public. Many youth were also unhappy about um, how the Prophet Muhammad and holy symbols were offended and ridiculed in the Norwegian public and also internationally. For example, in 2019 and 2020, the group Stop Islamization of Norway publicly burned copies of the Quran. A pressing question arising from this, which the 12 Shia groups in various ways sought to deal with, how to add was how to adequately respond to such offenses in a peaceful and socially acceptable manner was insisting on their right to freedom of religion. A third motivation for organizing was harassment from Sunni Muslim youth inspired by Salafi ideology. Uh, the Shia were accused of being infidels and many felt intimidated as some of the Islamnet members joined the Prophet, uh, Prophet Ummah group uh, who endorsed holy war on infidels. This created some nervousness amongst the youth. And if, again, a pressing question was how to adequately respond to inter-Muslim harassment in a peaceful and social acceptable manner and how to support each other. The answer to the identified problems and questions has been to develop new interpretive spaces to advance new understanding and practices of Islam in Norway by self-teaching in self-organized groups. Interestingly, to develop religious knowledge, the youth did not turn to mosques to seek help from peers educated in Islamic subjects. This is remarkable, I think, since the first um, 12 Shia mosque was established in Oslo almost 40 years ago, in 1979. Moreover, the mosque environment uh, is well known to most youth since as children they have accompanied their parents to the mosques, particularly on celebration of religious holidays. But instead the youth organized independ independently of mosques and relied on self-educating. Working together in groups to identify what knowledge was necessary to pursue. The justification for their independence has been a desire to develop an understanding of Islam, which is appropriate for living as Muslims in Norway. In explaining this to me, a young man um, said, we, the young, we know the local language. We grew up in the Norwegian culture and we can now create a Norwegian Islam. I now turn to a short description of how the groups worked, because I think that is essential to understand their thinking. So how did they work to develop new interpretive spaces to teach each other about religion through the methods of discussing texts, giving lectures and posting material online? Each group developed, developed its own method to create spaces that could inspire reflections around various issues regarding Islamic belief, practices and behavior.
One group translated Arabic and Persian texts into Norwegian and printed the texts as booklets. They were intended for a Muslim as well as a non-Muslim public and were available at an affordable price. During board meetings, the members decided which texts to translate and a guiding principle was to select topics they believed there was a need for more knowledge about. In conversations with me, a member explained that considering increased Islamic terror like IS, it was important to show that Islam stands for peace, love, grace and respect, and that Islam teaches us to help, collaborate and contribute to the best for everyone in society. In the view of the members of this group, information about the teaching of central Muslim figures had the potential of altering the way people thought about Islam. For example, a text authored by Ayatollah al-Shirazi explaining about the guidance offered by the Prophet Muhammad on how to behave was considered an important text to translate because it demonstrated that Islam is the path to grace and love. The second group translating texts also spent time discussing the meaning of the text at a study circle. They met every week, every other week, to translate passages from the Quran, Hadith, supplication prayers like dua, and speeches of the Prophet Muhammad, Imam Ali, Imam Hussein, and others into Norwegian and to discuss content and meaning. However, after the attacks in Norway in 2011, the members of this group changed their method. They felt an urgent need to counteract prejudice, hate and extremism and initiated interfaith dialogue collaboration with Christian and Jewish youth groups. In meetings, Muslim, Christian and Jewish youth introduced their religious traditions and ideas, for example, on fast and prayer, and discussed similarities and differences. They also visited each other's place of devotion, such as a church, a synagogue and a mosque. Another group expanded on the idea of interaction with non-Muslims by organizing street events in Oslo. Religious days of celebration and commemoration following the 12 Shia liturgical calendar were used as occasions for handing out self-authored texts to passers-by, explaining about the religion and social the religious and social significance of the persons and events celebrated or commemorated. Moreover, they offered people hot chocolate and cakes. The sharing of food is an essential ritual act, which in this context also facilitated communication in the street and demonstrated friendliness. The content of the textual production did not simply mediate established 12 Shia narratives, whether scholastic, theology, hagiography, or ideology. Rather, they convey, conveyed articulations of Islam, which were the products of the youth's critical concept, conceptualizations of their faith in the face of the current public debate on Islam, and their repeated encounters with Muslims and non-Muslims in the street. Instead, three groups chose to convene in seminars and lectures to teach each other about Islam. The members prepared speeches and comments on topics relevant to being a young Muslim in Norway and on the message of Islam. The format of the meetings resembled lectures and seminars at university institutions like yeah, university and colleges. Speeches were often supported with PowerPoint and 
followed by a question and answer session like the one we are participating in right now. Most attendants were familiar with this format from their educational background. The topics discussed were drawn from their everyday experience. For example, picking up on recent years' public debates about how poorly Muslims seem to integrate, one lecturer encouraged the audience to reflect on how Muslims could integrate and what Islam says about integration. Arguing that integration is the opposite of segregation, she underlined three points. Be involved in society, have knowledge, and interact with non-Muslims. On some occasions, however, critique was directed at the wider society. For example, during one question and answer session, frustration were, was raised regarding the status of religion in society. It was perceived to be a paradox that although there is freedom of religion, it is permitted to offend religion. One advice given was then to be patient, implying change is possible. During seminars and lectures, critical reflection on social and religious political issues were thus turned inwards to discuss how they, as Muslims, should react and what they could do to deal with the various issues. And the last example, two groups have chosen to communicate via Facebook and home pages. Facebook facilitates people responding to posts, which in this case sometimes resulted in long discussions online. Instead, on homepage, the method for communication is monologic, monologic. So what do they post? They post short and long articles explaining about religious holidays, charity work, stories about the imams and their sayings about worship and devotion. For example, that to read the supplication Siyarat Ashura is a good alternative when, like during the pandemic, it is impossible to visit Imam Hussein's shrine in Karbala in Iraq. An entry called Often Asked Questions takes the reader to articles discussing, for example, what is the rights of women in Islam and what does Islam say about terrorism? I will close now with some concluding remarks on how I view these attempts to self-organize and self-educate. And I return then to the introductory question. Um, why do 12 Shia youth in Norway organize in self-governed group, groups independently from the mosques? Well, as I see it, they were searching for ways to localize Islam in new interpretive spaces in the Norwegian society by exploring different types of educational methods, information, interpretive phrase, frames, questions and answers. What seems to be the benefit from organizing in groups independent from the mosques was to be able to define their own questions and explore possible answers based on their everyday experiences and perceptions of the time and society in which they live. Organizing in groups, they benefited from sharing resources, experiences and reflections, and it should be noted that many were members of several groups. Traditional authorities were partly sidelined in that they did not, with one exception, they were not, except with one exception, mentioned in any of the, um, sorry, I'll, I'll do this again. Traditional authority were partly sidelined in that they were not, with one exception, mentioned. So, for example, uh, the 12 Shia authorities, the Marja'a, the Marja Taklid, from whom the Shia Muslim layperson is supposed to to seek guidance, they were not mentioned. And a discussion in a group, group's meeting in 2015 may throw some light on this. 
Some members asked why it was not permitted to quote Marja Taqlid on Facebook and in the lectures, when in fact the religious scholars were being anonymously referred to. The explanation given by members of the board in this case was that discuss discussants often attack each other over which religious scholar is right and not instead of looking at the issue at stake and think about it. So instead, they wanted to develop a critical and dialogic model which encouraged self-reflection and which created spaces for debating and reflecting on what to think and do. In line with this, answers were often presented in an advisory style, often formulated in an open-ended manner highlighting ethical underpinnings. For example, a male lecturer discussing what does Islam say about the terrorism referred to a story about the generosity of the Prophet Muhammad and concluded that terrorism is evaluated as a great sin. The lecturer did not, not simply make the point that terrorism is un-Islamic, but offered an ethical alternative, which is to be generous. Defining generosity was, however, left for the individual to work out. The information offered by the youth groups span from information which can be transformed into a kind of knowledgeability described by the writer as stable, that is, knowledge which the knower can put into sentences and stories. And information that can be, on the other hand, information that can be discussed, evaluated, contradicted, and defended as true to develop understanding which implies a relation between the knower and the object of understanding. And this is a knowledge that is gained through experience. The youth's reflection on the Islamic message are, uh, do respond to ongoing discourses on the question, what is Islam? Which is not a topic only debated uh, in Islam, and then it is often defined by religious scholars, but it is also widely debated amongst non-Muslims. In developing critical reflections on the Islamic faith in response to local and global events and media debates, the youth continue a long history of what Dabashi has called dialectical conversation between Islam and major interlocutors. Localizing Islam implied using the vernacular language, develop a vernacular ter terminology to speak about Islam, and speaking to a local audience of non-Muslims and Muslims. It also meant engaging with current local and global issues such as terrorism, religious tolerance and pluralism, the right of women, and peaceful coexistence between Muslims and non-Muslims. The answers were ultimately expected to be developed by the individual member. The locally organized interpretive spaces created the opportunity for the 12 Shia youth to speak to society from the position of being a religious minority in a democratic society. These are my reflections on the material that I have presented to you, and I'm very happy to receive all kinds of inputs. Maybe there is something I have overlooked, maybe I am too positive, um, or perhaps you can also guide me into other types of, uh, similar types of research that has been done on the topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ingrid, for this um, interesting uh, lectures. I'm sure um, that that this will raise various questions. I have uh, some myself, but I'll st start first with um, 
uh, with the audience. So if 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 the uh, someone who has a question can raise his or her hand, and then we will um, uh, then it's possible to pose a question. So uh, I I can see Mario. So please, Mario, unmute your microphone. I think you can do it yourself. I'm yeah, not I sure. Is, is myself, it the case, uh, Petra? I think Stefan raised his hand first. Uh, is that uh, okay, <laughs> Stefan? If if that's the case, I'm. I I, I saw. Uh, I see no hand with uh, Stefan, but please, Stefan, uh, uh, pose your question. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. So if you if, if it's not possible to unmute yes. yourself, you can also post your question in 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 the in the um, in the chat. That's an alternative. So for the moment, please, Mario, if you can begin with your question, and then we'll see whether we can uh, go back Good. to Stefan. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Thank you for this uh, wonderful lecture. It's very very interesting, and it just happens that today I was part of a uh, PhD ceremony on mus young Muslim creating new space for themselves. Um, and, and, and that PhD also um, described uh, this kind of groups for Vancouver, Newcastle and Groningen. So I, I can pass on the link to her uh, PhD. Thank you very much. Uh, later on, it's just a very right. coincidence. Um, I have several questions and the most stupid question is, could you explain what you mean by the term and why you use that term interpretive space and maybe directly i can link it to you know if we talk about spatialities is there also a thing like interpretive temporality i mean what does space mean in this context thank you um I think we could very well also talk about interpretive temporality. Um, when I talk about interpretive space, I mean um, both um, to create a, um, a kind of a, a both, both a physical and intellectual environment, uh, a physical and intellectual space in which one can uh, discuss and then also present. Um, so, and I think this interpretive space is, it is to, in a way to, to speak, the, the, the ultimate goal is to speak about Islam in society and to, to, to even not just um, say, this is Islam, because that is what the parents' generation did, but to actually say, even to, to show there are different interpretations of Islam, so to create that space out there in society, but to do in order to do that, they have also first to create their own interpretive in, internal space in which they are then trying out which methods to use and depending on, like as I said, their educational background and experiences, they, they use different uh, methods to, to create that. But I think these are really, uh, uh, to, to explore these concepts will also give more detail to the analysis. So I think that that was too very good, a very good question. And did I, did I clarify it? Or do you have something to add? Yeah, no, I think it's clear. And it, it, I mean, it, it does, it is an inspiring concept. And I, I that's why I asked. It's, it's a mm -hmm. good term to think with, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, 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 uh, so, Mario, if, if so, so, perhaps you can try uh, to, to to turn to uh, Stefan again. Does it work now? Yes. yes. Oh. Yeah, we can hear you now. Great. Yeah. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention is uh, what, what what you mentioned uh, reminds me actually of a uh, sort of reverse uh, situation that happened in Germany. There's uh, a study that I'll put in the chat as well um, on. Um, extra mosque activity particularly among uh salafi groups 
um, that use uh, internet platforms in order to break away from more traditional and what we could say more uh, moderate understandings of of Islam. So I, I don't know if this will be useful for you in any sense, but they, they have a very interesting approach on uh, quantitative me uh, methods from digital humanities that might be mm. interesting to look at. Um, but be that as it may, I was actually wondering because uh, you, you obviously like um, the Shi'i communities that you mentioned, they uh, originate from a more Persianate world. And um, in the West, obviously, a lot of uh, Persian culture also translates into some fascination with Islam when it comes to, for example, Rumi or poetry on love and all of these uh, kind of uh, more mystical Sufi traditions. Um, do these groups tap into that as well when it comes to their uh, Western audience? Because there could be like some overlap, I would assume they, they might uh, profit from. Um, no, no, they don't. Okay. Uh, and uh, they are not, uh, some of them are, uh, they have background from Iran and some from Afghanistan, which has been Persian, as you say. But um, the majority of the refugees, because they have refugee background, so the, the majority of them come actually from uh, Iraq and now also in the last decades from Syria. So there is a very strong also Arab um, influence there. And th these are also in some of these meetings also because these va this varial national cultural backgrounds come into play when they discuss how to do things because they draw on each of them's cultural background and then there is even sometimes debates between them saying that, no, 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 it, it doesn't work. Uh, you do that in Afghanistan, but it wouldn't work in Iraq. Or, okay, maybe that would work in Iran, but it wouldn't work in Norway. So, you know, they have these debates back and forth. And um, uh, Sufism is not uh, much played, um, played out because uh, there is much more attention to the prophet and the, and the imams and the ahl al -Bayt. Hmm. I have a question that leads off into that, but I think... Oh, sorry? Thank you for mentioning those uh, the research in Germany. I will be very much interested in it because it, it is also contextualizing my study in the in a broader European context. So I, I believe they particularly focus on uh, networks online as well and like websites that are frequented by these groups. Um, so that might be an interesting resource. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'll, I'll now give the floor to Petra. Petra has a question too. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ingrid Flaskerud, for this very uh, in, uh, interesting uh, topic and interesting lecture. I learned a lot. Um, I have a question. Um, as you were talking about these Shiite youth groups, I got the impression to what uh, extent are these groups different than the Sunni groups? And do you yeah. see a kind of su Sunnification in these groups? What was your last question? If I see do some you, kind of... Do you, do you see a kind of Sunnification? In oh. these Shiite groups, um, what is that? Perhaps what's what? What is well, that, 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 the, the, uh, that they beco become they become nearer to the Sunnah Islam, mm. huh? and, um, and so deviate more from Shia the the regular Shia Islam. Mm. Um, because what you have you told told us that they go outside of the mosques they they, yes. they don't follow uh, the path of their parents and mm. well one way or another i assume but well i'm not a specialist that the path of their their parents is more the regular shia islam and in these groups well, as, as you told me, they had uh, contact with uh, IS at one point, uh, and they are integrated in the Norwegian society. Do they have contact with other Sunni groups? Or, uh, to what extent do they differ from these groups? And, and, and uh, well, hey, are the, those groups, these, those youth groups nearer to uh, each other than to mm -hmm. Sunni Islam and Shi'i Islam. 
Thank you. I think this is these are really questions for future uh, future research because um, this, the studies that has been done on the Sunni groups are mainly um, uh, student organizations, um, the, the, the independent youth groups have been mainly run by Sunnis since they are the majority, they are, they are so many more. So they have been in charge, for example, of student associations. Um, then most attention in recent years has been given to Islam Net and the Prophet Ummah that I mentioned that are in the Salafi orientation. And I haven't seen any research, uh, but it could be my my mistake. I have to look more carefully into it. But I I have not seen anything on how other Sunni groups try to address this Salafication of the Sunnis, of the Sunni youth. Um, and um, yes. And I would say that, um, and also uh, previous uh, Sunni groups, when they have been out in the streets informing about religion, their approach has been more towards this dawa missionary work, whereas these uh, Shiites have been very conscious about not uh, engaging into discussions that are about the uh, who is right and who is wrong. It is just about informing, this is what we think. And you can think what you want, this is what we think. Um, so they are very careful not to be perceived as they are out there to recruits and to, mission, to, to do missionary work, because that would be to put themselves in a position which is above others, right? You should become like we are. And that's not the point. The point is to say that we are okay, you are okay, you know, to put it very simply. Uh, but so I, I think your, your question is important because we, we really need more comparative work on, on, on this. Mm -hmm. I think it's so I, 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 I have an, uh, another question, but I'll first give the floor shortly to uh, 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 Mr. van der Schouw, uh, and then I'll pose my uh, question. I, uh, um, but let, let, let's hear first, yes. Yeah, I think the question just asked by uh, Peter de Bruyne is one of the main questions because ISIL and all these uh, terror groups like uh, Al Qaeda, they're all Sunni based. So, uh, and there is a big contradiction between these two Islamic uh, mainstreams like Shiism and uh, and Sunnism. So, I think. Uh, we're talking about 12 -er groups in, in Norway trying to get more understanding for Islam. So, uh, how effective are their efforts to, to realize that? Uh, knowing that the, the most problems we have originate from Sunni groups. Um, yes. I'm not sure if I, I understood your question. Oh, well, or it was a comment. I'm mostly so, involved in terrorism. It's, yeah. it's not the Shia, it's the Sunni, which is ISIL, for instance, Islamic State, is a Sunni group. Yes. They are, uh, uh, well, quite contradictory to, to, to Shiism. So, uh, if you've got these organizations in Norway trying to get more understanding for in Islam and organizing all kinds of meetings and, uh, and lessons or whatever, uh, the main so issue. So the, the main question is, yeah, were the they successful? The problem, not maybe the main problem. The, the the major problems are originating from the Sunni groups, not from the from the from the Shi'i groups. Yes. And uh, this is uh, precisely what these uh, youth groups are trying to convey, that they are trying to say that uh, um, uh, the, the, we cannot, uh, we cannot, they are moving away from this uh, mode of representation, of representing Islam in Norway, that we have to stick together. If there is diversity within, we look weak. Yeah. They are the young generations beginning to understand that if we show we, we are diverse, uh, it is actually to our benefit, and yeah, then we can show. Not involved in, in these things, yes. 
Uh, okay, thank you. So I, if I can post my, my last question. So as you might know, I, I conducted research on uh, among Muslim women's groups in the Netherlands. So mm -hmm. um, a similar groups as, as yours uh, here. Um, I, I publish uh, on, on this um, in, in, in Women Leadership and Mosques uh, in, in this edited volume yeah. by uh, Bano and Kalmbach. Yes, um, yes, it's very but, nice. So, but what I found, and that's somehow contradictory to what, what uh, to what you found, is that um, uh, your groups seem to be um, somewhat outgoing. So they were very much um, um, oriented towards the Norwegian society, whereas for me, for the groups that I um, uh, attended, it was often much more about finding a safe space for themselves rather than trying to um, uh, to uh, formulate an answer to the questions that society poses to, to them. So they want to create a safe space rather than uh, provide answer. And another thing is that that. Um, that still for them, uh, the the sources, the authoritative sources, were very important, but but the way they relate to the sources are different. So in that, in every group, you saw different ways of relating to texts. Mm -hmm. So in one group, mm -hmm. uh, uh, people might say the the imam is very important. What he says. It is we can believe that for others it will it will uh, it the, the uh, others mentioned their parents and again others said no it's always important to 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 um uh look into the sources yourself uh so there were various approaches uh to that and 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 but at the same time they said but making your own choice so just saying i i think this or this that that was so a kind of itch he had that was not okay. acceptable so i was wondering mm -hmm. how you see this so on the one hand this outgoing character of of the groups that you uh attended and on the other hand the way um uh the youngsters re relate to the sources mm. um so uh, they often refer to to the hadith of the imams uh and um it seems to me that in a way they are continuing a tradition uh, which is uh, very uh, prevalent. It is a storytelling, actually, uh, in conveying ethics in Islam. I also hear it uh, when the Imam is speaking on the minbar um, to convey stories. And that the, the, these stories are, you can debate what is the ethic, but it is also open to your own interpretation. And this is, this is a kind of an um, an openness that exists in parallel to all the specific regulations and, and rulings that you can hear from, a, for example, Embarja Taklid, which is more specific. Um, they, they do the interpretation of the text uh, according to certain methods. But then, in addition, in parallel to that, that, there is the possibility of the story which is being told, and you can reflect on it, and what is the ethical outcome of it. I, I think that um, they, um, uh, because they, they don't want to, to pull in the marja taklids, the, re the religious authorities, the, because that can create some divisions between them. Instead, they want to highlight topics and invite people to discuss the topic in a respectful manner. So like they would always say, the brother over there has a question or the sister over there has a question, or this was a very good point, thank you very much. They're very polite and uh, trying to... So, so um, and they do not refer to their parents. Uh, as I said, they, they, they do not bring in the, um, the, the religious scholars. They bring in the imams and their examples and the prophet and the example 
and then they discuss amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this idea of having a safe, creating a safe space? I think that the, the groups in its group in itself is a kind of a, a safe space, but it's not a safe space from the Norwegian society. The, I think that um, it is my impression that the society is not they, they it is not felt as a um unsafe space um it's more that well yes they they feel misunderstood they feel that they are not always recognized at the same time they also receive a lot of respect they feel that the the educational system often is supportive and um you know, there are various experiences of people who have faced problems, people who are who are able to maneuver very well and uh, are very happy to be to live, to live in Norway and the possibilities yeah. they have here. So I wouldn't say that they are looking for this is not to have a safe space. This is to find a way to empower themselves to be citizens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so it, th this is a very interesting finding. So uh, perhaps it, it it is in an in another context. It, it's more about um, um, uh, finding this out. For, for in the Netherlands, I I, I saw a completely different uh, uh, approach. Mm -hmm. That that's very interesting, and I. Um, so I should like to thank for you um, uh, to to thank you for this lecture. Um, mm -hmm. I, I hope that we um, can continue the discussion in other ways in the future. Uh, but for the moment, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you okay. all. Thank you all for your comments and inputs. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So the next week there will be another lecture. very much uh, for uh, for this lecture yes next week uh, there will be a le lecture by vanessa newby mm -hmm. and most probably uh, we will have to do that online as well because of the COVID situation in the netherlands but you mm -hmm. will uh, see our announcements uh, about that and what's the topic about the top the, the topic it's uh, well uh, it's uh, the international studies and, uh, yes. and 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 the middle east okay so that that will be the topic of next week okay that's interesting yeah yeah so a very nice invite so I, do you remember that i uh, approached you for this uh, for for uh, i i bought this film from you yes and did you did you you were able to show it to your students yes i i, I approached you in 2016 and i uh yes. to, to ask you for this film and i bought this film from you and you also gave me many interesting references for um uh among other things about studying um uh studying and uh, um, um um muslims and 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 uh using um visible techniques in this so filmmaking yes um yeah, so i often use this it. material in in my lectures so so it's 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 very nice um for that reason i always remembered your name and that's one of the reasons that we approach you for the what's new so it's it's it has a history <laughs> yes Thank you. Could you tell me a little bit about the, the response from the students? Because I, I hear different things from people that some people think that um, it is very emotional. They start to cry. Others says that this is mass, what is this, suggering. It is uh, a very bad religion. I, I get different responses. What no, they, they, so, so it, 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 I always use this film in uh, a course on pilgrimage. Yeah, and uh, so and we 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 discussed pilgrimage in various places. So not only Muslim pilgrimage, but also Christian pilgrimage, uh, all kind of sacred journeys. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 for that, and and then we also show this. And of course, it 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 it's. Um, uh, it shows many things, but I um, 
it, 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 it opened up uh, a new world for many. So it was mm -hmm. one of the possible expressions of what 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 uh, um, pilgrimage could be about, or mm -hmm. or having these um, 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 uh, meetings amongst women. So mm -hmm. I, I I think that that that's um, um, so it, people were not so much confused, uh, but more it opened a new world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll um, but I'll um, um, uh, in the, in the last few years I, I didn't teach this course. So I um, uh, next year I will do it again. So I I assume that I'll see how how things are changed again. Mm. How things have changed, but uh, it is interesting. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, for me, it is also very special to see the film again because some of the uh, my my key interlocutors and the people who performed or acted, I mean, appear in the film, have died uh, of illness and old age and so on. So you know, this was done now. It's been many many years ago, and um, and um, yeah. yeah, yeah, things have changed. Yeah, but, no, uh, the, 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 I understand. Yeah. So, but I'll certainly use also the 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 pilgrimage book uh, um, on, uh, on on pilgrimage in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so I I'll, I'll, I'll certainly come back uh, again. But for me, this, this other so the the lecture of today was very interesting for me too because it had so many similarities in a sense mm -hmm. uh, what I did, but the, the outcome was so different. Mm -hmm. So, so are you familiar with my book, uh, with my contribution to this in this book of uh, Kalmbach and Bano? Yes, I have looked at it very brief, briefly, but it was some time ago, and I am I'm glad you mentioned it now because it it reminds me I should go back to it and also thank you for the the information from Germany because I will piece these things together because. Uh, I have, for the time being, written only a very preliminary text about the study, and I, I want to, to work more into both the analysis of this, this data themselves, but also contextualize them in a broader European um, mm -hmm. context. So, so that's uh, it's not, and um, there is also there is a lot actually written about Muslim youth in Europe. But um, often, uh, also the in, the in the relation to the individualization of religion, and um, how religion is influenced by sex.